We serve the God of multiplication in every aspect of our life. God is always multiplying good things into our life. We're going to talk more about that here in a few minutes. God bless all of you victorious people of God. As always, it's a privilege and an honor to be with you and especially to share God's word with you. Trust everyone had a great week this past week and I believe and I even decree this over your life that this week is going to be much better. It's going to surpass not only what occurred last week in the areas that were good, but it's going to be much, much greater than you can even imagine. Hey, go ahead and get your Bible out, or however you're following along from uh, maybe, maybe from a, a tech perspective, whatever works with you. We're going to just begin to dive right into this topic we've been looking at in the previous two weeks, the overall topic of planting it and seeing it grow, seed time, harvest, sowing and reaping, uh, just foundational principles from Genesis to Revelation that God has established, He has decreed, He has actually even de de declare that it is a universal principle. It it's one of the laws of the Lord sowing and reaping. For what it's worth, it's referred to as the law of reciprocity. Yep. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I know you're familiar with this, but it, but it does much good. It builds our faith, it bolsters our faith, it encourages us to continue to sow and always knowing that as we sow and whatever we're sowing, we're going to see a harvest come back into our lives so we can continue the, this cycle, this lifelong cycle of sowing and reaping. We're going to start in the book of uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 26. By the time we get to the heart of this message, you're going to say, oh, man, I've always loved those scriptures. They've always encouraged me, always put faith in my spirit. So that's going to happen by all means, because that's, that's what God's word even uh, promises, that when faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're going to build our faith from God's word, specifically in the area of sowing and reaping and seeing a great harvest come into our life. Amen. Genesis chapter 26, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Genesis 26 verse 1, the word of God reads as follows. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. For unto thee and to thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Verse 6 says, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Now, you know, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, the, the crux of our message is a little farther down. But I just want to stop right there and, and bring this to our attention. I know you're familiar with this. I touched on it last week, uh, much more detail, much more length. And that, that is the biblical principle, the irrefutable law of God referring to this doctrine. And that is whatever you sow, that is what you're going to read. Galatians chapter 6. Remember that. I know you can quote it. You're familiar with it. So when we begin to understand... In everything, there's the seed, right? The seed is even in itself. I mean, that seed multiplies, correct? We, as we touched all that last week. And then as we concluded last week, what, whatever a person sows, that is what you are going to reap. So the that, the that that was sown is the that that you're going to reap. We kind of had a little fun with that even last week, if you remember that. Uh, say that again. So anyway, when we, when we fully comprehend that spiritual law, that universal principle from God's word in the kingdom of God, the economy of God, is there again, whatever we are sowing, whatever anyone sows, be it good or bad, be it righteous or be it evil, be it holy or profane, 
be it love or hatred, and just go down every category in every given participle of that which can be sown. Literally, figuratively, spiritually, financially, any, any area. That which can be sown, which all things can be sown. Thoughts can be sown, which will bring forth a harvest of creativity. You know, and Solomon put it this way when he said that I, I prudence dwell with wisdom and seek out, I search out witty inventions. So what even there again, even to thoughts in seed form, they can give way to some of the greatest ideas that humanity is still waiting on. As a matter of fact, that's how most inventors begin to create a given invention is they have a thought. The seed form is in a thought. They begin to sow that seed. They begin to nurture and see that seed burgeon, mature, you know, come into this, this full maturation to where now they have at least that first prototype of that given invention. So it is with playwrights. So it is with authors. So it is with chemists, scientists go down the list. Even there again, the thoughts, the create, creative ideas. I wisdom dwell with prudence and seek out witty inventions. And that, that's what God has done in your life. That's what he's doing now. He'll continue to do that. I said a lot to say this. Everything has a seed form. And when you sow that seed, as we were just discussing, even in a thought form, there's a seed in that. Words have seeds within themselves. Words of kindness, words of mercy, words of forgiveness, words of encouragement. When you are sowing words, there will be a harvest, of course, that, that's going to bless those who hear them and it'll even come back to you. Don't want to get into the negative stuff and the ugly stuff that, that people say and, and can definitely... Here's the thing, you know, God summarized it th thusly. Pertaining to any kind of evil seed, demonic seed, uh, seed that is destructive and so forth, this is how God put it. He said, when you sown to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. So, so there, there, there are many negative things, many destructive things, many uh, hurtful things that people can sow that also, though, it will come back to them and they will reap the world. They may have sown to the wind to initially hurt people, but it will come back upon their own head, David even said. So anyway, here's what I want to focus on. I, I'm just really pressed in my spirit. As a matter of fact, before I started ministering, I could, I could back up just about an hour or so ago. The Lord really began to impress in my spirit. So I, I, I want you to unfold this. Take your time and unfold this. Because there again, everything has a seed, right? Those first, primarily the first three verses that we just read a moment ago, uh, referring to... Uh, Isaac letting us, reminding us that, you know, Abraham is his father, right? And uh, I know we're all familiar with that, but it's like the Bible is always reminding us to understand what's going on in the present tense. And uh, then, then we see that, that God begins to speak specifically to Isaac. This is what I'm going to do for you. Uh, specifically here, of the specific, I want to break, be specific about this. Notice this. Verse 3, when God said, I want you to sojourn in this and I will be with you. I'm going to bless you for unto thee and your seed. I will give all these countries, these nations actually is more accurate. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto your father. And then he goes on to say, verse 4, I'm going to make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now notice, notice verse 5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. This is so important for Christians, especially Christians who have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Metaphorically speaking, the word seed used here is encompassing the biological aspect of Isaac's life, he being a biological seed of his father, Abraham. And we all know those stories. Not to digress much on that, let me keep moving here. So this is what the Lord just really put in my spirit. So before we get to the crux of the message, I'm going to stay here for a moment because somebody needs to hear this. 
That biological seed that God has blessed you with, that's a promise from God to you from the moment of conception. That seed, son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, great-grandson, great-granddaughter, that biological seed that God has blessed you with, and we, we're reminded also from the Word of God, the book of Psalms, that children are they're a heritage, and heritage of the Lord. That word heritage, it means an heirloom. In the Hebrew language, that word initially, specifically means they are an heirloom, meaning a priceless possession, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. When God blesses you, blesses His people, which is one of the first commandments that God gave. He, he commanded blessing to come upon Adam and Eve, and he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply, meaning replenish the earth. He commanded that there would be a blessing within the biological seed within them. God has given you those children, and even some of them may not be serving God right now. Some of them may not be living for God right now. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they're coming back to the kingdom of God. They are coming back to serve God. They're coming back to live for God. They have a call on their life. God has not, because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. God does not remove what he has called. God does not remove what he has gifted. God has called some of your sons, some of your daughters, some of your grandsons, some of your granddaughters into the ministry. And I want you to know, God specifically just burned this in my spirit, like I mentioned a few minutes before I started ministering, is that I want you to remind my people that the seed that I bless them with, it will, it will produce. It will produce a great harvest, spiritual harvest in their life, which in turn is going to be a great harvest into the kingdom of God. So I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to be cast down. I don't want you to think that your sons or your daughters or your grandchildren are too far gone. The devil is a liar. You're going to see them come back to God. You're going to see them serve God. You're going to see them begin to operate in the gifts of the Spirit like never before. You're going to see them begin to mobilize other people to serve Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When God has given you that seed, that biological seed, that seed will produce. That seed will bring forth fruit. That seed will bring forth a harvest that will bring glory and honor to God in Jesus' mighty name. I want you to rest assured on that. I want you to stand on that promise. And when God reminded, when God reminded Isaac, he said, Isaac, look at the, the, moms and dads and grandparents and great grandparents. This is what you need to get. Verse five, because that Abraham obeyed my voice. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge. You know, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why you were kept alive when you were out doing stupid stuff and crazy stuff and all of us did at one time before we either came to Christ or came back to Christ. It was because you had a mom or daddy somewhere. You had a, you had a grandma or grandpa somewhere that was praying for you. Might have been an aunt, might have been an uncle, great aunt, great uncle. Somebody in that lineage was praying for you. They were praying over that seed that God would hasten his word to perform it in your life. The one, of the, one of the reasons why the devil didn't kill you and didn't devour you and didn't take you into his kingdom in perpetuity is because you had somebody, somebody in a family lineage, somebody praying for you. And because they served God, they sanctified you as the seed and a rightful heir to serve God all the days of their life. We are a byproduct. I am a byproduct of my parents who served God, of my grandparents who served God. Daily, and it seemed like each passing year as I get just a little bit older, a little bit wiser. My wife even says I'm better looking too now. But anyway, I realize more than ever, I stand upon the shoulders of my parents and grandparents. And because God has blessed me, it was really all because of my parents and grandparents before me. Don't you think, don't you think that God's promise has stopped with you? It will transcend. It will transcend you as a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent. 
and it will touch that biological seed that God has given you. And God will preserve that seed and you are going to see a spiritual harvest come into their life like never before. Somebody needed to hear that right now. Why don't you, why don't you just kind of, kind of, uh, type in something, put that on the screen. I don't even know the terminology, what that is, but you know what I'm saying? Somebody say, somebody say, Hey pastor, that's for me. I needed to hear that. That encouraged me. Just give me, give me some feedback there that I know that I, I was striking the iron and letting you know that, listen, because you made a covenant with God because you as a grandparent made a covenant with God decades and decades and decades and decades ago because you as a parent made a covenant with God and you've walked as faithfully as you possibly could for decades and decades serving God. God will make sure that he will preserve your seed. He will make sure he will preserve your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters in Jesus' mighty name. Now here's what you need to understand. Let's begin to get in the crux of this message this is what you need to understand also about seed, about sowing and reaping, about planting and harvesting. Let's back up to verse two. This is imperative to do and not to do, I can say, cover both sides of that proverbial coin. In order for you to be consistent in planting and seeing the harvest and sowing and reaping of what you've sown. You cannot go down to Egypt. You cannot go down to Egypt. Notice this. Let me, let me draw your attention back to this. Genesis 26 Verse two, remember, we see verse one, there's a famine in the land. There's a famine in the land. Now, the land where the famine was, was Gerar. The Bible makes it very clear in verse one and it picks back up in verse six that Isaac stayed in, in Gerar. So you notice this, the Lord appears to him and says, go not down to Egypt. Do not go down to Egypt. This is what happens. This is what happens in life. We get into a difficult passage of life. We begin to just remotely see some kind of famine, some kind of difficulty, some kind of unsettling issue, some kind of regression. We begin to see something that is going contrary to what we believe and what we know that God has promised. Now, when that begins to happen, one thing you cannot do is that you cannot go down to Egypt. Now let me enlarge upon that. Throughout the Word of God, Egypt is used, other than when it's used literally. Now here it's used literally, but also you continue to read throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, even into the New Testament. Egypt is synonymous with the world, the world system, the world structure, the world's social order, the world's way of thinking, the, way, the, the, the world's way of acting, the world's way of viewing. They're given worldview is worldly steeped in, rooted in, grounded, grounded in, and planted in Egypt. Time and time again, in both the major and minor prophets, they would prophesy and God would speak through them and, and tell the people this, do not go down to Egypt. Now, what, he, what they're figuratively speaking, spiritually speaking, was saying, do not adapt to and adopt the ways of the world. Do not adapt to and adopt the cosmos. You find that word in the New Testament, that word co uh, cosmos, it's, it just simply means the world's social structure, the world's system, the world order. I'm not talking about one world order, that's completely different, very interesting topic, I'd like to teach on that sometime. But it's talking about there again, the way the world operates. When the word of God declares, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of it. 
We're in the world, we're not of it. Paul put it this way. Listen, he said, look, you need to be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You need, in, 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 in order for us, in order for us to completely break free of the world's structure, there again, the world's thought processes, the world's view, you have to completely sever your ties with the world in every area. And some say, well, that, that's a given, Pastor. We, we, we know that. We know that because, you know, I, I, I'm not sinning like, you know, like, like I was when I was living in the world. And that, that's good. That's wonderful. Praise God for that, right? Aren't you glad for His grace and strength that empowers us and equips, equips us to break off and break away from those things that we used to do when we were in the world, but now we are in, we are hid in God through Christ, Jesus. So when we begin to realize, okay, okay, I'm not in the world, Pastor. I'm to, we're talking about across the board and here specifically, because it seems like in many regards, this, this is the last area that Christians will still dwell in Egypt. And that's the area of sowing and reaping, specifically sowing. Let me use another word, giving. There are Christians that they're not, they're not committing the sins of Egypt and even they, they've, they've changed their worldview to a biblical view of the world. They're not acting like they used to act. They're not thinking how they used to think. They're not... That's how, you be, that's how we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Remember that, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago from Romans 12. They're, 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 they're no longer connected and pulled down and even this strong magnetic pull back into the world. And that's not the issue. And that's wonderful. Praise God. But it seems like in many regards, the last area for Christians to get totally set free from and not habitate in Egypt is the area of giving. Because Here's the world's view of it. Here's the world's structure, structural order when it comes to giving, when it comes to money, when it comes to saying something nice even to people, when it comes to helping, when it comes to sowing any act of kindness and goodness. Any, to sow anything, they want to hold on to that, especially when it comes to money. They want to hold on to that. You, you, you know, you know the, the people of this world especially the elites of this nation, the elites of this world, you know they think we're fools, don't you? You, you do know that, right? They, they think we're actually losers. I'm, I'm not going to quote who has recently said that, multi-billionaire, multi thinks that Christians are losers. Think, think, they think that God is a loser. They think that Christians who believe what we believe and endeavor to live our life according to the Word of God, that we're a bunch of losers. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'd rather be a loser in the eyes of the elites of this world because I know when that's occurring, I'm a winner in the eyes of God. And so are you. And don't ever, ever think anything different than that. But that's how Egypt looks at things is there again. They hold on. They, 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 want, to, they want to just gather, gather, gather and not sow in, in, in so many areas of their life. Oh, and I know some would say, well, I, I heard that billionaire gave so forth and so on. And all actuality, they didn't gave, give. It was from their foundation. And you really trace the money trail back and actually stayed in their foundation. And it's be, it would be the equivalent for you giving five bucks. But they, of course, want to herald it throughout the world. This is what they did. And you, you're not giving something that doesn't cost you anything. And you're not giving something if it actually, no, I can't get into that. But anyway, bottom line is this. That's the system of the world. That's the thought process of the world. Christians understand this, is that everything we have in our life is meant to sow it into the world, to sow it into the lives of people, to sow it into the body of Christ, to sow it into our brothers and sisters. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all people, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. First and foremost, we're sowing to the people of God, the household of faith, the local church, and there again, our brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church and all those throughout the world. We're sowing goodness, we're sowing kindness, we're sowing love, we're sowing mercy, we're sowing encouragement. We're sowing faith as we, as we speak the word of God over them. 
We sow our finance in the local church. We sow also our finance into other proven ministries throughout different parts of this nation, nation of the world, to help spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the reasons why the the uber elite think that we are foolish and think that we are crazy. The thing about it is, that is exactly how the residents of Egypt view life and view things. Whereas we, as the residents of the kingdom of God, we understand the only way we can see a harvest is you have to release, you have to sow, you have to plant. There has to be the the, the sowing of the seed, as we touched on even last week, in order to see that harvest come back into our life. So don't go down to Egypt, especially when it comes time to sowing. Don't ever think that, oh, if I sow this now, I'm not going to have what I sow. Well, that is partially true. Whatever you sow, you're not going to have that any longer. But what's going to come back to you is so much greater in multiplied volumes than what you sowed initially. We'll say more about that here in just a minute. But hey, if you're sitting with anyone, I want you to look at a few people and say, listen, don't go down to Egypt. Do not go down to Egypt. Do not, do not, do not go down to Egypt. There again, a lot of Christians are still living Financially, they're still living in Egypt because they don't want to release finances. And the thing about it is, you're never going to see the harvest until you sow the seed across the board. But just wanted to focus on that one specifically. Look at this. You need to also, all the days of your life, wherever you are at, you need to sow where you are at. Wherever you are at, you need to sow where you are at. Notice this. We, we read uh, a few minutes ago, all the way down to verse 5, talking about a biological seed, right? Verse 6, it says, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. He stayed there where God says, Stay here. Don't go into Egypt. Do not lean on the arm of the flesh. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Do not, do not begin to live, think, act as the world does and and employ certain tactics and principles of the world. Don't do that. Don't go down there. We see that Isaac was obedient. I'm going to tell you something. Obedience is the first step in seeing a harvest come. Obedience is the first step in seeing a harvest come. To obey is better than sacrifice, the Word of God declares, as Samuel told Saul. God declares this in Isaiah chapter 1. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. What that phrase means, eat the good of the land, you will have an abundance of prosperity to enjoy in your life. If you're willing and obedient, back to this issue I want to say again is that obedience is the first step is the first step of being blessed for that which you've sown and that of course which will come back into your life which you have sown so isaac was obedient because there again verse six he dwelt in garage where the famine was somebody say where the famine was the famine wasn't in egypt i should have said that one earlier the famine wasn't in egypt the f- things are going well. In the, in the natural, things look good in Egypt. In the natural, things were plentiful in Egypt. In the natural, there was abundance in Egypt. In the natural, there was a superlative measure of all things in Egypt. In the natural, it looked like everyone was being taken care of and everyone's doing fine in Egypt. It was not the case. God said, you dwell here in Gerar. You dwell here, and if you will dwell here, and then out of your obedience from that point, if you will begin to sow, be obedient also in that next step. God said, let me show you what I'm going to do. So we we read all all the way down, verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land. Everyone say that land. Isaac sowed in that land. I got to say this again. All the days of your life, 
You have to learn to sow where you are at. Because when you sow where you are at, it will take you to where you need to be. But if you can't sow where you are at, God can't get you to where you need to be. So if you will be obedient and dwell where God says, and as you're dwelling where he says, and you sow where you are at, that, those two, those two items of, of obedience will cause the floodgates of heaven, the windows of heaven to be opened over your life. So where you are at, across the board, across the board, if you will just begin to sow right where you are at. Look at this. If, if you are at a place of discouragement, you need to sow encouragement. Say, Pastor, how in the world can I sow encouragement when I'm discouraged? Remember it says of David in 1 Samuel that he encouraged himself in the Lord? When he encouraged himself in the Lord, those around him got encouraged. See, it's, it, it, it is wonderful when people do speak words of encouragement back to us. And when they do, it's all because that we sowed words of encouragement. We encourage people. Can I help you with this? Every day, encourage somebody. Every day, encourage somebody. People you don't even know. Encourage them. Because this world is, is so cynical. It is so, it's becoming more and more hate-filled all the time. Everyone needs to be encouraged. Start sowing words of encouragement to get a harvest of encouragement come back into your life. If you are not, hear me out on this, and this applies to every area, but if you are, if you, if you are not hearing anyone encourage you, start sowing words of encouragement to yourself. Don't wait on somebody to even start saying words of encouragement to you. Start encouraging yourself. Because if you will just start sowing seeds of encouragement to yourself like David did, that, that alone will begin to bring forth a harvest in your spirit, in your soul. And other people will see that because the two things, encouragement and courage, they are very contagious. People want to hang around those who are encouraged because that means they're filled with courage. Whatever it is in life, if you just begin to sow that where you are at, so for, from the place where you are at in life, whatever you're going through, so in that area to where you need to go, to where you need to be, to where you want to go, to where you dream of going eventually. But you have to begin to sow right where you are at. You can't wait until you reach this certain place of, of prosperity and productivity and uh, effectiveness and favor. So one of these days, when I get to that place, when I'm there, when I'm at that at, then, then I'm really going to begin to sow when I get to that at. No, 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 no. Right here, right now, in the at that you are at, you need to begin to sow like never before. Because this is what happens. When you sow, when you sow where you are at, Oh, the Spirit of God will not let me go on this. So I'm going to say it again. When you sow where you are at, it will take you to where you need to be. When you sow where you are at, it will take you to where you need to be. When you sow where you are at, it will take you to where God wants you to be, where God is already predestined for you to be. But he's waiting for us to sow where we are at. You know, like, like, a, like a lot of Christians will say this. Oh, you know, when I start making more money, I'm, I'm going to be able to sow. Uh, I, I, I'll be able to tithe regularly and sow offerings, you know. And, and I, I can't wait to sow. No, 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 no. Right where you're at financially. Well, it's not much. No, 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 no. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is right where you are at. You have to begin to sow there. God can't bless a future time of sowing. He blesses your present time of sowing with a future harvest. But you can't wait to get some time into the future where you think that things are going to improve and get better. And then you're going to start sowing. When you start sowing where you're at, things will get better in the future. Look at this. And Isaac sowed in that land, right where he was at, in the land of famine. How 
in the world are we ever going to know that this thing about sowing and reaping works? How in the world are we ever going to know that planting and harvesting, seed time and harvesting, is going to work? How are we ever going to know if we don't sow when it's inconvenient? If we don't sow when it's difficult? If we don't sow when it's uncomfortable? If we don't sow out of our familiar, familiarity of zoning and, and habitation? How in the world are we ever going to know that God is a God of miraculous harvest into the life of his people that sow if we don't sow where we're at? In your famine, you need to sow. In your distress, you need to sow. In your perplexity, you need to sow. In your discouragement, you need to sow. When no one is there to help you, you need to sow. You need to sow, you need to sow, you need to sow right where you are at. You're never going to get out of that famine where you are at until you first start sowing. Somebody needs to hear that. So notice this, there again, back to verse 12. We're still in Genesis 26. And this, I'm about to finish my opening here, my introduction. Verse 12, a little humor there. Isaac sowed in that land. Oh, it's like I can't get off of that. Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Well, I would say so, would you? And Isaac sowed. In that same year, he sowed in that land. He sowed where he was at. And he received the same year a hundredfold. We'll get to the hundredfold in just a moment. I know you know what it means, but it's always good to be reminded of it. It puts greater faith within us. Renewed faith and vision for that hundredfold return. Let's look at this first. Because Isaac sowed in that land of famine, where he was at. It goes on to say that the Lord blessed him. One of the reasons why, one of the reasons why that hundredfold return, I'll enlarge upon hundredfold here in a moment, but one of the reasons why hundredfold will come into a child of God's life is because they sowed in a given famine. They sowed in a difficult time in their life. They sowed when it wasn't easy. They sowed when it wasn't convenient. They sowed when it took all they had to sow. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the return. That's just one reason. This is a teaching within itself, and I do not have time to digress much on that hundredfold return. But that's one of the key biblical issues that cause a hundredfold return to come into the life of a child of God is because when you are sowing in your given famine, you're sowing where you are at, and it's taking everything for you to do to sow. It's taking everything you can do to encourage others because you're so discouraged yourself. It's taking everything for you to do to pray for breakthroughs in others when you need a breakthrough 10 times worse than they do, but you'd never say anything to anybody. It takes so much greater effort for anyone to sow in those given areas and other areas that we could keep extrapolating. And when you do, that's one of the reasons why that hundredfold return comes. Because there again, the greater the sacrifice of the seed, the greater the harvest that comes into that person's life. When Isaac sowed, in an extremely difficult time in his life. If you study, and I'm sure you have, previous chapters, that the, even in the ensuing verses and other chapters, he, he, he was, he'd just come out of a, of a difficult time in his life. He was still in a difficult time in his life. And somewhere deep down on the inside of him, what his father, by faith, planted on the inside of him. 
He dug deep and he sowed in a difficult time in his life when in the natural, according to the world system, you're a fool, an idiot. But you see, we are only moved by seeing him who is invisible. We are only moved by faith and we are not remotely moved by sight. We are only moved by thus saith the Lord. We are only moved by what we know God's word says. And we are only moved by our experience, how God has dealt with us and blessed us and turned things around so much better than we could ever, ever even imagine. That's what we're moved by. And that's what Isaac was moved by in this time in his life. He dug deep, he sowed, hundredfold occurs. The Lord blessed him. Let me, let me just say this real quick about hundredfold. I know that all of you know this, but always there, it, this is what bears repeating. That's hundredfold, not hundred percent return. Hundredfold simply means 100 times. 100 times. Jesus used the very, this very teaching. Remember when he was teaching about the parable of the actual, actual parable of the seed and then the four different types of soil and some will bring, and that good type of soil will bring for 30, 60, and 100 fold return. 30 times, 60 times, or 100 times return from that seed that was sown. We as God's people need to stand on that every day. Every, everything that we sow, every time we sow anything that's tangible, intangible, things of faith, things of the spirit that we are sowing, finances, any and everything that we are sowing, we need to be reminded that the Holy Spirit, I pray the Holy Spirit always reminds you that everything you sow, there again, literally, um, physically, spiritually, metaphorically, tangible or intangible, that which you are sowing, may you always be reminded by the Holy Spirit, there's a 36, even 100 fold return coming back upon what you have sown. That hundredfold return there again is 100 times. You could do the math real quick like you sow $1,000. What's hundredfold return on that? $100,000. And you could just keep extrapolating that. You want to go down. You want to, want to go, go higher on that. And I know some people that might even just come across this by random and say, oh, there's one of those. There's one of those prosperity guys. Oh, you know, all they want your money and all that. You know, the devil is a liar. This is this. This is straight from God's word in order to help God's people to believe, practice, and receive. I'm going to say that again because that's the order right there. To believe it by faith, practice it, do it, and then receive it. That's how things work in the kingdom of God. So what, I, what, what, I, what I'm delivering right now, look, this, this isn't mystical, it's supernatural. This isn't new age, this is the, the spirit of the living God, edicts from God's own word and from his counsel, his immutable, irrefutable counsel found in his word. This cannot be annulled. It cannot be silent. Remember, as long as the earth remains, Genesis chapter 8, remember that? Verse 22. As long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest. And your harvest, which I pray again, is going to be 30, 60, 100 fold into your life, all the days of your life. So when we see this hundredfold return that he received, I gave you a couple reasons why and the effect of that. The Lord blessed him. Notice this, verse 13. And Isaac, he began to prosper. He continued to prosper until he became very prosperous. Notice this line item of, of successive prosperity. This line item of succession, if you will, is that... From this, sowing in famine, sowing where he was at, giving in the natural what he, he didn't, he couldn't afford to give. I mean, he just stepped out big time. And even before that, I mean, he, he, was, he was giving up himself. He was sowing himself into the lives of those in his family, those who were connected to him, those he was in covenant with. He was stepping outside of himself to sow into their life. There's another reason why God blessed him. 
in every area of his life, not just financially. Always remember, prosperity is not just about money. Prosperity is this wonderful, wonderful, I refer to it as spiritual umbrella that God has provided for his people. That spiritual umbrella that God has provided for you, you're under that covering, you're under that protection. And, and underneath that, as God is pouring down his blessings upon you, it's because of you taking that step of believing at what God has said and you being obedient to that and then you begin to see the results thereof. You begin to see the harvest. So the Lord blessed him. But that's the beginning because this is always the will of God for you is that you begin to see the prosperity. So there again, money's under the, the umbrella of prosperity, right? The, or you could even say it's wrapped up in, in a godly envelope of, 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 of God's, uh, God's, God's envelope of prosperity in, includes a lot of things when you open that envelope up. Yes, it is financial prosperity. It's spiritual prosperity. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prosper. So I want you to prosper financially. I want your soul uh, to prosper. It's already mentioned that your spirit's prosper because you're born again. So you're, you're, you're prospering spiritually, you're prospering financially, you're prospering emotionally in your soul, and, and also that you be in hell. That now I want you to prosper physically. God wants you to prosper in every area of your life, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and financially, relationally speaking. From a familial perspective, we started out with that, that biological seed. God wants, God wants you to have a prosperous family, meaning endowed with richness, memories that will last a lifetime and even in generations to come. So that, that's, that's what we're talking about, prosperity. So when, when the Bible declares, Genesis 26, 13, that Isaac began to, that, that the Lord blessed him, Isaac began to prosper. God's blessing which the blessed Lord that maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. The word of God declares in the book of Proverbs. Always remember that. God's blessing will always enrich your life. God's blessings, every blessing will always prosper your life and he adds no sorrow with it. Somebody needs to hear that. So what, this is what happens. When you sow and you begin to see the harvest come back, you begin to prosper in that area that you've sown. God begins to prosper you in that area. He makes sure that you continue to prosper in that area until you become very prosperous in that area. See, God doesn't stop with just beginning to prosper you. Because we serve, we serve El Shaddai. He's the God of more than enough. So God... You notice Genesis 26, 13 doesn't say, and, and Isaac began to prosper, and that was all. Because the Lord blessed him, Isaac began to prosper. And the Lord continued to make sure that Isaac continued to prosper until Isaac became very prosperous. So as you are beginning to prosper, every page, every volume of your life, in every facet of your life, as you're beginning to prosper, past, present, and even future, there's the beginning, there's the continuing of, it, of the prospering, then there is the full orb glory of the prosperity level in that area of your life. You begin to prosper, you continue to prosper until you become very prosperous. Okay, you may not be very prosperous in certain areas right now in your life. You may, you, you may think you're not very prosperous spiritually or emotionally or relationally or even financially or other areas in your life. You, you may not think you're very prosperous in those areas, but listen, what God has started, being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it, will perform it, some versions read, until the day of Jesus Christ. What God starts, he's going to complete. God will perform it until the completion comes to pass. So as you are beginning to prosper in life, and as you are continuing to prosper in life, God's going to make sure you get to the level that you become very, 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 very prosperous in your life, in every area, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you, God, that when you begin to prosper your people, you will continue to prosper your people in times of famine, 
in times of stock market volatility, in times of geopolitical upheavals and wars and rumors of wars, that when you begin to prosper your people, God, you are not moved by the systems of this world. You are not governed by the laws of Egypt, oh God. You, oh God, set the laws, the universal principles to come to pass into the lives of your people. I ask that you would begin to do that now like never before. May your people begin to prosper like never before. May they continue to prosper like never before. And may they become extremely prosperous in every area of of their life spiritually emotionally physically relationally within their families oh god their businesses their vocations that they are employed in financially god begin continue until your people become extremely phenomenally prosperous in every area we thank you for that even now we ask it in jesus christ's mighty name and all of god's people say amen and amen and amen and a man. Time always gets away from us. Wish we could go longer. Listen, again, privilege and honor to be with you as always. You guys are the greatest Christians in the world. You have enriched my life. See, God has prospered me with you being in my life. And I'm so thankful for that. And I just bless you and I just speak all types of prosperity upon your, your life, your family, everything that you, are, you have and you are continuing to put your hand to do, may it prosper like never before. May hundredfold return begin to break out in every air that you are sowing, even now. Continue to stay in, in, in touch with us uh, through our, our, our social media avenues. And uh, please reach out, let us know, let, us, let your zone leaders know. If we can help in any area, we love you immensely. God bless you. And you are, you are going to have a hundredfold return. Like coming into your life like, like you can't even imagine. Love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Go and prosper. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.